Welcome back to the Mind Watercolor Workshop, everybody. This is video number three. And today we're going to be working on a botanical. Now, when I say botanical, you probably think of still lifes and florals and that kind of a thing. And that certainly is a part of it. But the botanical tradition is something that's got a very long storied history. It goes back, oh, at least a couple hundred years. And it began as a scientific illustration tradition. Um, and lately there's been a real resurgence in it as just an art form. But it started out as a very highly accurate way of rendering plants uh, for scientific journals and for scientific illustration. The style depends on high detail, a lot of control, and very almost photographic type reproduction. A lot of great artists though today are bringing this back as an art form. And it's just a really great way to study and paint plants. Today we're going to be doing this rose. On my workshop page I've included the photo reference if you want to use this. You don't have to. You can use your own picture of a rose. And as I draw it and paint it, I will be departing from some of this a little bit. This is just to give me a guide. So anyway, let's get started and I'll show you what we're going to need. Now in this painting, I'll just be using a number 10 round and a number four round. As long as they have good points, that's really all you need in this painting. In addition, I'll be penciling in with the same pencil I did in the landscape videos, and I'll also be using a kneaded eraser. I like the kneaded because I can mold it and get fine erasures. I'll be using exactly the same color palette as in the landscape videos. All of these colors will work to get the tones that I need in the rows. This time I'll be using Strathmore 500 series Imperial in the 140 pound hot press. The hot press just gives me a smoother surface and I get crisper, sharper details that way. As for the work setup, it's pretty much the same except I will be doing all the work on this upstanding easel. I have no reason to put it at a lower angle because we're not going to be using any tremendously large wet washes, so I'm not worried about excessive rundown to the bottom. I'm using the same palette, although a large mixing area is not as beneficial in a case like this. So if for the rows you want to use a smaller palette, you can. For convenience sake, I'm just going to use the same one. Now as I lightly pencil the rows in, the way I'm thinking is I'm I'm breaking it down into sections that I'm going to paint. Sort of thinking of it in terms of setting it up for coloring. You know, the way you might approach a coloring book. So, you want to look at the rows. You know, lightly pencil it in, in little pieces and sections. Roses are pretty easy to draw. Just try to get the gist of the shapes and the petals. You don't have to have the perfect proportions of the photo. All right, so I'm getting close to having the rose part pretty well defined. You know, the most important thing you can do when you're drawing this is spend time observing. I mean, observe the most minute details. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to paint it that way, but when you're drawing, just notice how petals overlap, where they overlap, how the tops of the petals turn over and appear to overlap the underside of the petal, how the outer petals do the same thing, see how they turn and then they appear to overlap. Draw these little overlaps and on the edges here where you're given a little bit of edge, make sure you render those. And something as tightly detailed as a botanical, the more accurate you can have those contours drawn, the better. And having these contours drawn accurately and broken down like this will just give you a good guide when you're painting. Now in these green under leaves, underneath the rows, some pretty little interesting twists happening here. I'm actually exaggerating those a little bit, and I'm going to define those in, in light and dark so that 
where they twist, the underside's going to be dark, and I can add more light in here. Use a light touch when erasing. Very light touch. Don't want to do anything to bruise the paper. Again, even with something as simple as these leaves, make sure you notice and pay attention to details. The edges are not smooth. They're, they kind of ruffle a little bit. And there's a sawtooth edge. Right? So you want to suggest some of that. You don't have to put in every sawtooth, but notice, you know, that it, it isn't a perfectly round edge. And also notice that the little sawtooth shapes point towards the tip. They don't just point straight out. This is the kind of observation you have to do in something as meticulous as botanicals. Yes, it's possible to do these impressionistically and expressively. But right now, I'm just working in the standard classical way with botanical illustration. I'm trying to make it accurate. I like that part of the art form. Back in the day, you know, if you got the shape of the leaf wrong, you didn't put things in like the sawtooth, you know, someone could misidentify the plant. That's how important it was. Now it's more of an art form now, but if you're giving an homage to that classical art form and you want to do it accurately, then you need to be very, very observant. Art is always up to you, though. If there are details you want to leave out, you know it's going to be for art and you just want it this way and you say well I'm not doing this for a scientific journal of course it's your art but if your goal is to make it very accurate you want to exercise your observation skills now I'm changing some things with what's in the reference I made this leaf crossover which my eye likes I'm making the top of this tip turn so that I can get some light play coming from lighter and down into shadow on the leaf because the leaves in the reference I think are just a little too flat. I've significantly redrawn these leaves over what the reference had just because I wanted overlaps in different places and as I mentioned before I wanted some different highlight and shadowing opportunities. So I've got an arrangement with the leaves that I like but at this point now I'm just tightening it up, making erasures. And I think I'm pretty good to go. Um, all I'm going to do now is go through and basically pat all the pencil with a kneaded eraser just to get it as light as I possibly can. In some places where you draw and redraw and, and adjust, the pencil can get a little dark, so I'm just uh, lifting as much of the excess pencil as I can. So once I'm done with this, I think I'm good to start painting. Well, we're going to start working this rose here. And as I mentioned before, when you're drawing, think in terms of, of sectioning it off in coloring book fashion. I'm going to work one section at a time, in this case one petal at a time, and let those dry. And I'm going to work very light and gradually in successive layers build up dark. This is the whole process of glazing. You don't necessarily try to get your full range of light to dark in your first application. That's a whole different painting technique. That's a sort of a a la prima, all at once painting. In glazing, you build. And notice how light I'm putting this down. I'm working from the shadowy area and consult your reference while you're painting. 
working from the darker area and pulling it out. And it's just a series of blends. And all my blends are very simple. It's just painting down the color and the pigment, wiping out your brush, and lifting on the edge. Sometimes before you lift, you may have to rinse it. But usually when the color is light, you don't have to. I have a very, very pale wash there. And you can go back in and dab into the shadow uh, a little bit of wet and wet. And go ahead and start building the shadows that way. But just remember in glazing, you don't have to build the shadows all at once. You want to start your modeling. Just to give yourself an idea where you're going with it. And just like with the drawing, your observation is very important here. Start noticing the color shifts, where it shifts from pink to yellow and the peach colors in between. And then some places in the shadows, and I'm going to add a little Payne's Gray and go ahead and block in this. In the shadows, it'll be a little bit bluer. You don't have to be a total slave to your reference, but do try to get some interesting variation in the color. As I work the colors in the rows, let me show you how I'm, I have my palette working. Uh, I'm using the Indian Yellow and the Quinacridone Red, and a combination of those colors, and I let them kind of pool here in the middle, will produce anywhere from you know, this this nice reddish tone down to this yellow tone with a lot of peach tones in, in between. As you add water and make those paler tones, you get all the nice red and yellow peachy colors that are in the rows. So I'll go back and forth with very pale applications of either of those. What I've done from other parts of the palette is I brought down a little sepia and I brought down a little Payne's Gray. So I can dab into those as I go to either get cool shadows or warm shadows. And I've, I can even turn this red into a little more reddish brown in places by coming over here to the red iron oxide. All of the applications are very slight, very pale, very small washes. So setting it up like this as I'm glazing usually provides enough paint to do the entire painting. As I fill in these sections, I, I need to let the previous sections dry, so I skip over and go to areas where uh, they're not going to touch. Otherwise, I'll get color bleeding into each other. But in glazing, successive applications are applied wet over dry. That's usually the case. Go ahead and tackle this little shadow area here. Blot out my brush and blend the edge. Very simple blending technique. Practice that if you are not comfortable with it on the fly. You need to be able to do that little blend over and over and over again, almost without thinking. If you're not sure how light a highlight should be, leave it white. In doubt, leave it white. That's sort of the rule of thumb. You can always go back in and add to white, but recovering white is very difficult. It's still a little wet, so I can go ahead and keep in that shadow. I know it's going to need it. Blot out my brush and lift to blend. Once you get the practice and the hang of, of that blending technique, you'll be able to blend watercolor anywhere as easy as you would with a pencil. This is my light source. It's coming this way. And there's a lot more yellow on this petal in the reference, and I like that, so I'm going to keep that. So it's a lot more peachy. And I can paint this petal almost flat. And while it's wet, I'm going to go ahead and dab 
So I'm right up there because it does change to red up in that shadow. At this point, when these washes dry, they'll be very pale. And you'll you'll be able to see that they're not dark enough, but you're just starting to get your values modeled. Add a little Payne's gray and come down here on this shadow petal. It's a little darker and grayer. It blends out almost to white there or a very light yellow, but I'm going to blend it to white again because so I'm not sure yet how light I want that to be. So cleaning out my brush, blotting out my brush, and blending that edge to white. This is the, the neat thing about glazing. You just have a lot of adjustment possibilities. You don't have to sweat it, but keeping in mind that all your adjustments are going to be taking it to the darker values. Now, since I didn't come all the way to that edge, it's dry. I'm just going to go ahead and paint in this. I don't have to worry about bleeding. And I'm just going to continue that way in my first pass around the rows. As soon as these areas have dry, then I can paint the area next to them. I'm paying careful attention as to where the highlight edges are, preserving them, and observing what areas are lighter or darker than the other as I model it. I'm coming back to this. this is pretty much the last petal in the first pass. It's these surrounding sections are dry now, so I can come in here. And tackle this. You can see here you can do a little bit of wet and wet. That's fine but I'm still approaching it very lightly. I'm not trying to get real dark yet. Just, uh, I know that this petal is darker than most of the others, except for a couple spots. So I'm taking advantage of the wet in wet for some blending. Well, that's drying. I'm going to come in here on this petal. Just even though these are adjacent, I'm not going to paint that edge so it won't bleed. It's painting this this far edge here. So I'm going to add a little tone there. Let's blot my brush. And it turns into a sponge and I wick it back up. All right, so that's my first pass on the rose and all very pale still, but now I'm getting an idea of where my values are. I'm probably going to go in and start picking up and lightening some of this pencil. It's, that's still a little too dark. And I'm going to assess the shadows and what needs to be darkened. But I think I'm going to do second and third and future passes all at once. So I'm going to move on to the green. Well, this week, I think we're going to leave it here. Hope you'll join me next week as we finish up this workshop series and we do the second part of this rose. We're going to go do the first pass of the greenery and the stems. And then we'll do our final detail pass on the whole rose. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye now.